So as we continue our discussion on the Civil War event, we're largely going to be sticking with the Civil War Frontline series regarding the tie-ins of Civil War issues number 5, 6, and 7. And the reason for this is because while the other tie-ins give us a little bit of information, maybe some background, they're not nearly as important as these other comics. And for the most part, they don't really give us a whole lot in terms of progressing the Civil War event. If anything, they really kind of begin to wind down and really kind of begin to uh, move towards this ultimate goal. And for the most part, the ultimate goal is something that we will see unfold. But the Civil War Frontline series is particularly important going forward until the series ends because, as we will see, it really kind of evolves into this whodunit kind of mystery scenario. And then with Civil War Frontline issue number 11, we ultimately really kind of get this big reveal of why it was the entire Civil War event happened in the first place. And what we see as we move forward with Civil War Frontline issue number 6 is that uh, Jim, who is a co-worker of Ben Yurik is really kind of talking to Ben Yurik and all, all Jim really does here is just kind of provide a little bit of maybe comedy I guess he really kind of talks about how he himself is considering registering and of course uh, uh, Ben Yurik tells Jim that he doesn't really have a secret identity but but Jim really says that that S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't really know that. That S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't really know that he's not a superhero. He could simply just claim to be a superhero who is obscure and has no real powers. And his whole reason for this is because the superheroes that are registered with S.H.I.E.L.D., they get a pension, they get a good salary, and the benefits of being a uh, pro-registration member of S.H.I.E.L.D. is really just better than the situation that Jim's in right now. Again, this isn't necessarily something that we could take seriously. It's just kind of designed to give us a little bit of humor. What we also see is that in the background, Ben Urich is packing up his things. And Ben Yurik is really just kind of, uh, I guess, maybe vacating his office. Jim doesn't necessarily catch on to this right off the bat, but then he really kind of picks up on it and asks Ben Yurik if he's going somewhere. And Ben Yurik replies by asking him what was his first clue. From here, we see that Ben Yurik is leaving his office and he runs into Robbie Robertson. And this is really kind of interesting. We see that uh, Robbie Robertson asks Ben Yurik where he's thinking and, uh, you know, where he's going and, and what he's doing. And uh, uh, Ben Yurik really kind of replies that J. Jonah James Jameson had fired him. Now, Robbie Robertson replies that this is just the way J. Jonah Jameson is. It's just kind of the way he is as a person. And Ben Yurick says that after the first, you know, 15 years or so, it was kind of funny, but it's not really funny anymore. And he's really kind of had enough of it. In addition, we really kind of see Ben Yurick getting angry with Robbie Robertson because Ben Yurick believes that this whole, uh, this whole idea of the Green Goblin is an important story. And there's more going on with the Green Goblin than meets the eye. And that the Green Goblin had threatened the family of Ben Yurik, and so Ben Yurik is not necessarily going to take this as a very light thing. Uh, what we really kind of see here is that Robbie Robertson ultimately kind of strikes a deal with Ben Yurik, and what he says is that the Daily Bugle exists to sell itself. The Daily Bugle exists to really kind of make money, and that if the Daily Bugle is not reporting the story of the time, which is the current Civil War and registration issue, then the Daily Bugle will lose money. But if Ben Yurik is able to provide any kind of uh, truth and verifiable proof that the Green Goblin story is something worth reporting, then Robbie Robertson will back Ben Yurick completely in the face of J. Jonah Jameson, even if it means the two of them could potentially be fired for it. From here, we transition to Sally Floyd. And what we see is that Sally Floyd is in some kind of undisclosed location, and the room that she is in really kind of, uh, I guess, appears to be one of these rooms that's designed to, uh, I guess, maybe intimidate her, but she's not very intimidated by it. In addition, an anonymous voice comes over the intercom, really kind of speaking to her through one-way glass, and there's really kind of some witty banter here. We, of course, see that this voice is asking her questions, like, who was the individual that tipped you off in the market? in Chinatown and so on and so forth. And we see that Sally Floyd is really just kind of providing some witty banter. She's really kind of providing uh, sarcastic answers, and she's not taking this very seriously. In addition, what we also learn is that the person who's asking her these questions is Eric Marshall. And of course, we had discussed how Eric Marshall was one of the individuals or the individual that had arrested her in the first place. From here, we really kind of see the two of them argue back and forth. And we see that uh, Eric Marshall is attempting to establish himself as the authority figure, 
but Sally Floyd's really not having any of it. And she really kind of talks about how, you know, she thought this was a free country, but it's really not the free country she, she thought it was when members of the press can be arrested in violation of the Constitution. In addition, we really kind of get a little bit of backstory here between uh, Eric Marshall and Sally Floyd. And we learned that, of course, Sally Floyd had done a lot of reporting and really kind of done a lot of investigating on Eric Marshall and learned that Eric Marshall was part of the NSA and that Eric Marshall has a, a wife and three kids. But we also kind of learned that Eric Marshall had apparently hit on her during the uh, the previous year's Christmas uh, press corps conference and that Sally Floyd had rejected his advances. And so this possibly indicates to us that the reason why Eric Marshall is being so tough on Sally Floyd is really kind of a way of getting back at her because she refused to accept uh, his sexual advances. But what we also see here is that there is a second person behind this one-way glass. And this person is Reed Richards. And Reed Richards tells Eric Marshall that he is interested in offering Sally Floyd a deal. And we see that Eric Marshall pairs these words by telling Sally Floyd that they're interested in offering her a deal. From here, we switch back to Ben Yurick. And we see that Ben Yurick has been assigned to cover the uh, chemical plant incident, which was really kind of taking place at the same time that they were reporting it. And we see that Eric Marshall, I'm sorry, that uh, Ben Yurick is really kind of embedded here. Now, what it means when a reporter is embedded it, as I understand it, is that the reporter is in the midst of a conflict and is reporting the conflict as it unfolds. And the purpose for this is for the American people to really kind of get a non-biased report of the conflict and what happened through the eyes of the reporter, as opposed to getting a biased report of what took place at the hands of whichever government agency was kind of, at, I guess, uh, involved in this incident per se. In addition, we, of course, see this conflict really kind of going on. We see the thing and we see Daredevil and and uh, Goliath and Ant-Man and all these individuals fighting one another. And for the most part, we really kind of see this from the perspective of Ben Yurick, which is really kind of interesting here. Because, again, this gives us kind of this understanding of the mindset, the viewpoint of the normal civilian when we see these major incidents take place, these major fights go on regarding this civil war, super, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, superhuman civil war. In addition, of course, we see see that uh, Ben Yurick is watching as Thor arrives, and we see, of course, that Thor kills Goliath. And this is really kind of a shock. This is really kind of uh, an incredible thing for Ben Yurick to witness, and even he himself is really kind of astounded to see that. He's really kind of caught uh, unaware, so he really doesn't believe that this is what's happening, that Thor would legitimately kill a person, and Thor would really attack some of his closest personal friends. And this is really kind of an interesting comic book thing. This is really kind of a uh, fascinating because what we see here is that the relationship between various superheroes, the, the relationship between some of the founding members of the Avengers and the friendships that they have maintained over the years isn't something that's known only to them, that everybody knows about it, that everybody is aware that Thor is one of the more prominent superheroes in the Marvel community. Everyone knows that the friendships between Thor and Goliath and Captain America and others dates back decades. And so it's really kind of a, a shock to see uh, Thor at attacking basically his own friends in such a ruthless and unquestionable way. From here, we transition to seeing uh, Ben Urich interviewing Tony Stark. And Ben Urich is really kind of interviewing Tony Stark in two ways. The first way is, of course, he's asking questions about what went on, about why it is that Thor had attacked the, uh, I guess, uh, Captain America's team, about why Thor had been so ruthless and why Thor had killed someone. Now, Tony Stark's really kind of elusive here. He's really kind of dubious in terms of his answers and really kind of tells Ben Urich that the only thing he can say is that in due course, Thor will be completely exonerated, but doesn't really go into any more detail than that. In addition, we see that, um, I guess, Ben Urich begins his other line of questioning, which involves the Green Goblin. And he really kind of uh, asks Tony Stark why it is that he's allying himself with such dangerous and, you know, I guess, albeit criminally insane individuals like the Green Goblin, why he would allow someone one like the Green Goblin to uh, to be released. And then we see that Tony Stark really kind of refuses to answer this question and ultimately walks away. And so from here, we switch to 
Sir Robbie Baldwin. And this is really kind of an interesting comic, really kind of an interesting uh, set of circumstances. We, of course, see that Robbie Baldwin is, uh, I guess, is, is now in the negative zone area and is really kind of, uh, I guess, maybe writing a note to his mother that we see and really kind of talking to her about things that he sees as he's being transported uh, throughout the negative zone. And he talks about how, uh, I guess, in words of sarcasm, that this place is referred to as Fantasy Island and that he can't really understand why so many of these people are homesick. And of course, again, this is a bit of sarcasm. And what this really kind of shows us is that these conditions in the negative zone are very harsh, are very, uh, very cruel, I guess. These individuals are not really kind of receiving the necessary medical treatment for common illnesses or for injuries they sustained over the course of their apprehension, that instead, in a lot of ways, these individuals are being made to live like animals. And what we see is that Robbie Baldwin is taken to a location where he meets with Reed Richards. And this meeting between Robbie Baldwin and Reed Richards is really kind of interesting here because we see, of course, that uh, Reed Richards is really kind of trying to appeal to Robbie Baldwin, trying to tell Robbie Baldwin that they're interested in offering him a deal where he can, again, register himself and effectively be free of incarceration from the negative zone. But Robbie Baldwin doesn't really want to have anything to do with this. Robbie Baldwin doesn't really want to have anything to do with this entire uh, superhuman registration movement and doesn't want to register uh, as a member of the of S.H.I.E.L.D. forces. In addition, we really kind of see him, uh, I guess, maybe um, arguing you know, further with Reed Richards. And, and Reed Richards goes as far as to say that Robbie Brown has, uh, Robbie, Robbie Baldwin has really kind of changed. That Robbie Baldwin is really not the same kind of, uh, I guess, individual that would listen to the other side. That he's really so entrenched in his ideologies that he refuses to accept that anybody else could possibly be right. But then we see that, that Reed Richards really kind of changes his tune, that he really kind of uh, sings a different song, and he tells Robbie Baldwin that he will give Robbie Baldwin the chance to speak in front of Congress, to tell Robbie Baldwin, or to tell Congress his side of the story, to tell Congress what went on, and to really kind of give the American people a chance to see Robbie Baldwin for who he is. Now, Robbie Baldwin is initially skeptical about this. He's initially, I guess, a little unsure about this, but ultimately he uh, agrees and decides to take the opportunity to speak before Congress. From here, we transition to him being transported with She-Hulk, and She-Hulk is really kind of talking about his choice of attire is a terrible decision, and we see that Robbie Baldwin has chosen to wear his old speedball costume. Now, the whole basis behind Robbie Baldwin choosing to do this is because he wants to show the American people that he is still a super superhero, that he is still a good guy, and that the new warriors were good people. But She-Hulk doesn't think this is a good idea, and the reason for this is because She-Hulk thinks this is Robbie Baldwin's chance to really kind of turn over a new leaf, to one, you know, I guess really tell his side of the story, but two, to show people there is more to him than the perception that society has of him, that he is inherently a good person, that he was acting as best he knew how, and that the perception of him as being some sort of warmonger baby killer is not correct. But we see that Robbie Baldwin is opposed to this idea. In addition, Robbie Baldwin uh, and She-Hulk are really kind of exiting the uh, the transit van, transit bus, and we see that security is far less lax than it's supposed to be. Because of the fact that Robbie Baldwin is, in effect, the most hated man in America at the moment, security should be multiple times what it is right now. And She-Hulk calls attention to this, saying that there's supposed to be more security than this, and something just doesn't seem right. In addition... As we see, an individual shouts Robbie Baldwin's name, and when Robbie Baldwin turns around, we see that this individual shoots him at point-blank range. From here, we again transition to Joe, and what we see is that Joe is now in his full Atlantean uh, form, that he's no longer, I guess, uh, assuming the form of a normal human being, and he's really just kind of floating in the water and, and really just kind of talking in his uh, normal Atlantean language, which of course is something that we can't understand. And then we see that he exits the water and uh, begins to walk along a pier. Now, this is really kind of uh, an interesting scene because what we also see is that Wonder Man is following him. And what we also see is that uh, Wonder Man is informing, of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. that he has tracked down Joe, he has located Joe, and that he's really kind of trying to uh, figure out what to do next. His initial inclination is to act directly, is to get involved with Joe, to somehow kind of, uh, I guess, attempt to apprehend him or attempt to stop him. But we see that he's told not to by S.H.I.E.L.D., that he's simply told to just 
monitor Joe, to really just uh, kind of uh, keep track on him, to really just kind of surveil him, but to take no physical action, which of course Wonder Man uh, agrees to do. What we also see is that uh, Joe is heading towards a warehouse, and we don't really know what the purpose is at this point in time, but of course we see that Wonder Man is again continuing to follow Joe and continue to monitoring him. But then we see that Wonder Man lands on the roof of the warehouse that Joe had entered, and when he looks inside, he calls for backup. And what we learn is that there's some kind of a delegation of multiple Atlantean forces meeting here, although at this time, we don't really know what their intention is. So as we continue with Civil War Frontline issue number 7, what we see is that the Daily Bugle is in full business mode. The area is pretty chaotic and everybody's really working on something. We see that uh, individuals are calling other individuals, that they're taking phone calls, they're sending faxes and so on and so forth. And the place is for the most part total pandemonium. It's really kind of what you would expect to see in a very busy newsroom. We see that Robbie Robertson is answering phone calls, he's putting various people on hold, and when Ben Urich calls, he answers him. And he he asks Ben Yurik where he is, and Ben Yurik says that he is at the Capitol building where he was assigned by Robbie Robertson in order to uh, cover the uh, meeting between Speedball and Congress. And then we see that uh, that Robbie Robertson informs Ben Yurik that there may be more to this story, that Ben Yurik may be right about the story involving the Green Goblin, and that Robbie Robertson ran some of Ben Yurik's concerns past Tony Stark, and Tony Stark clammed up. And due to the experience that Robbie Robertson has in the news industry, that this is really kind of an indication to him that there really is something more going on involving this Green Goblin story. We then see that uh, Robbie Robertson is really trying to figure out where Ben Yurik is amongst all the chaos and amidst all the uh, the news media at the Capitol building. And Ben Yurik, of course, points himself out and lets, uh, lets Robbie Robertson know where he's at. And then we see that Speedball and She-Hulk arrive. We then, of course, see from the perspective of Ben Yurik that, again, this individual calls out the name of Speedball and that he shoots him at point-blank range. And we see that, uh, that Ben Yurik really tells Robbie Robertson that he was not the one that shot him, that he's not the one responsible for this. Now from here, we switch to Sally Floyd. And what we see with Sally Floyd is that she is still being held in an undisclosed location. And this situation is really kind of unique here. The way that this comic panel really kind of unfolds, the way that it's given to us, it really seems as though she is crying, but not necessarily for any of the reasons that we would expect. She's not crying because she's afraid of being held indefinitely. She's not crying because uh, of the whole Civil War, um, I guess, superhuman registration issue that's going on, or that she may or may not be released on bail. She's crying because she's an alcoholic, and she needs some alcohol. From here, we see that an individual named Congressman Sykes enters her holding cell. And Congressman Sykes is really kind of an interesting character when it comes to Marvel Comics. Congressman Sykes really kind of, I guess, rose to prominence in Marvel Comics after the events of House of M, and especially regarding his stance on mutant registration. And he's really kind of, I guess, maybe expanded his stance on mutant registration to the Superhuman Registration Act. And of course, he is pro-registration. And he's an individual that Sally Floyd has really had qualms with for quite some time. They've really bumped heads quite a bit, especially when it came to his initial stance on mutant registration. We see that he hands her an envelope but tells her not to open it until he tells her when, uh, tells her to, to actually, uh, I guess, open it. And um, he says that when she does look at the contents that she may very well rethink her position as she's really kind of taken this stance and really kind of made it, uh, I guess, outright that she doesn't like Congressman Sykes at all. From here, we see that the two of them kind of begin to converse a little more. And Congressman Sykes says that he is very similar to um, to Sally Floyd, that the two of them are both patriots, the two of them are both doing what they think is best for the United States, that they're doing what they think is the right thing to do. Congressman Sykes says that he believes the Registration Act is fair, and that it's the best and brightest hope for uh, the country to maintain the element of superheroes, with superheroes being held responsible for their actions, rather than really kind of turning a blind eye to what's perceived to be vigilantes in costume. In addition, 
we see that uh, Congressman Sykes says he is going to get Sally Floyd out of uh, being held, that he is going to allow her to be released. And when she asks why he would do this, he says because he understands that if there is any one thing that the two of them hold to be the most valuable thing, it's the Constitution. He talks about how when he was younger, he had served three tours in Vietnam, about how he had been uh, injured in the line of duty, how he was a prisoner of war, and that he and some of his friends, some of whom were killed, had suffered and had really kind of endured this fate in order to ensure that people in the United States were able to maintain their right to free speech, that the members of the press were able to maintain their right to remain free from prosecution as they attempted to report information the best way they knew how, and that if there was any one thing that the two of them agreed on, that it's that one concept, that one aspect, that they hold the Constitution in the highest regard. We see that Sally Floyd uh, really kind of uh, believes this is a ruse, and she calls him out by claiming that this is a trick. We then see that Congressman Sykes tells her she can open the envelope, and when she does, the envelope reads, you will accuse me of trying to trick you, at which point he replies to her and says, who is more predictable, me as a congressman or you, considering that your answer was written on an envelope before you even opened it up. And at that point, we see that Sally Floyd really kind of admits that she hates Congressman Sykes no, uh, no more than she does right now because he's absolutely right about her stance and her predictability and her outrage involving the superhuman registration movement. Now, what we also see is kind of a transition to Osborne Industries in New Jersey. And we see that Norman Osborne is meeting with some individual that we don't, we really can't see. We don't know who they are. This individual is really kind of cloaked in shadow. And this individual is providing Norman Osborne with a means to suppress the nanobots in his body. And if you recall, when Tony Stark and Reed Richards and Hank Pym began the process of enlisting the aid of supervillains to help round up uh, superheroes who refused to register, they installed in their bodies nanobots. And the nanobots would be a means of control. If these individuals uh, choose, uh, chose to go rogue, or if they chose to simply not follow the instructions that were given to them, then the nanobots would initiate an electric shock, render the person person unconscious and they would then be collected by shield and this kind of substance is being given to Norman Osborn is going to override that it's going to take away the ability for the nanobots to effectively do their job which will really kind of allow him to go rogue and to do his own thing and to really kind of operate outside of the parameters that have been specified for him by shield what we also see is that this individual seems to be somebody on the inside, that neither Tony Stark or Reed Richards or Hank Pym or any of those guys will be prepared. They'll be completely caught unawares when they realize that the person that's betraying them is a person on the inside. From here, we again transfer to, or I guess uh, transition to uh, the Capitol building, to Robbie Baldwin. And this portion of the comic in my opinion, is one of the most well-written aspects of the entire Civil War event. For the most part, we don't get a whole lot regarding Speedball or Robbie Baldwin in terms of him, I guess, having any direct conversation. What we really kind of see here is that he's writing a letter to his mom, and the comic really kind of unfolds in a way, or this portion of the comic really kind of unfolds in a way where he's basically pouring his innermost thoughts and feelings regarding everything that's happened since Stamford, Connecticut. He talks about how, um, you know, he had intended to go before Congress and he intended to lie. He intended to tell them whatever it was that he felt was the right thing to do. He intended to tell them something that would assuage his guilty conscience, that would effectively absolve him of any feelings of guilt that he had over the, the issue in Stanford, Connecticut. And the reason for this is because he really kind of regrets everything. He regrets the fact that he developed superpowers. He regrets the fact that he was even, you know, part of the New Warriors. And he really kind of takes time to reflect on this. He really kind of takes time to look at his past and to really talk about how he misses his dog and how he and his dog used to sit on a particular position on the steps of their stairs waiting for their dad to come home. He really kind of reflects about how his mom never really gave him a whole lot of attention and his dad never really gave him a whole lot of attention. He really kind of talks about how he looks back on the past when he first developed developed his powers and became a member of the New Warriors. He talked about how when they first encountered Terax, when they first encountered Thor, uh, when they really kind of got carried away and, and, and when they were young and they were reckless and they were really kind of foolhardy. He talks about how he wanted to start a reality TV show and that some of the other individuals didn't want to do it. They were really kind of hesitant to, but he really kind of pushed them. And he really kind of pushed them even further when they went into the, uh, to the home of various supervillains, one of which 
which housed Nitro and really kind of initiated the entire uh, Civil War movement. And he talks about how this reality TV show would be their chance to really show what they were capable of, but that they ended up blowing it instead and initiated this entire event. He really kind of um, talks about how if he said, if he really kind of admitted publicly that the new warriors were at fault, that it would really kind of emotionally traumatize him. But while all this is going on, while all of this is taking place, we see that there are various kind of effects going on in the ambulance. We see some electric shocks that are really kind of revving up. We see uh, She-Hulk, who's really kind of trying to understand what it is that Robbie Baldwin is saying. And he really kind of is, appears to be slipping in and out of consciousness, or as far as she can tell, he's slipping in and out of consciousness and he really is kind of calling for his mom and really kind of uh, speaking his thoughts outward really kind of uh, I guess speaking uh, outside of his own mind about what it is that he's thinking and he says that he really couldn't bring himself to say that the new warriors were at fault that the new warriors had made a mistake because if he did then he'd have to admit that all of his friends are dead that all the new warriors and that all those kids and that all those people that they're all dead because of him. And we really kind of see that his body begins to kind of convulse, that his body really kind of begins to uh, jump up and down, that it really kind of begins to, I guess, maybe go through what appears to be a seizure. And then all these electrical discharges are taking place all around him. And then we really kind of see this bright flash of light, and we effectively see what appears to be the, uh, I guess, the ambulance partially exploding and then crashing into another vehicle. Now from here, we again pick up with the story of Joe, but what we see here is that something has happened. There's been some kind of incident that has taken place between the time that we, uh, I guess we discussed Joe and Civil War Frontline issue number six, and now. There's apparently been some kind of attack that has taken place that has resulted in the death of all these Atlanteans and uh, what presumably is the death of Wonder Man. We of course see that the detectives Donna and Keith are investigating this entire situation, and they're really, again, and trying to figure out what's going on. They see that some of the weapons belonging to these Atlanteans are still around the premises, and of course they uh, have forensics lay down various markers so they can really kind of ensure that the crime scene is maintained as best it can. We of course see that various individuals are investigating the Atlanteans themselves, and the question arises, why were all these Atlanteans meeting here in the first place? What, what were they doing here? What was going on here? But then of course we see that uh, one of the, one of the uh, I guess, uh, paramedics discovers that Wonder Man is still alive. They then begin to kind of uh, address him, really kind of begin to, uh, I guess, tentatively ask him questions, despite the fact that he may very well be slipping in and out of consciousness or be in the last moments of his life. And then we get kind of a flashback to the events that took place between Civil War Frontline issue number six and issue number seven. And what we see is, of course, that Wonder Man is continuing to monitor the Atlanteans inside this warehouse as he's on the roof. And he keeps calling for backup from uh, from S.H.I.E.L.D. And then he looks behind him and sees that somebody is approaching and asks S.H.I.E.L.D. who this individual is. And S.H.I.E.L.D. says they haven't sent anyone yet. We then realize that this is the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn. What we also see is that Norman Osborn lays waste to the entire warehouse and effectively kills all these Atlanteans. Now, this is a very, very important thing. Thing. And the reason why is because we will see in later instances of Civil War Frontline that this causes a huge ramification, but that this also ties in to the very ending of the Civil War series and why the entire Civil War series happened in the first place. What we also see is that Wonder Man is, of course, injured alongside the Atlanteans that are killed. And this really kind of brings us back to when the detectives first found him alongside these dead Atlanteans in the first place. Now, the actions of Norman Osborn here is something that I would like you to, to again, kind of pay attention because it seems very uncharacteristic. For the most part, while Norman Osborn can sometimes be considered an insane individual, even when he's not the Green Goblin, the Green Goblin still has his own kind of agenda. He really kind of does his own thing. And it's very rare that we would ever see the Green Goblin arbitrarily attack Atlanteans knowing what the ramifications for this could possibly be. And so again, this is something I would like for you to keep in the back of your head because this will become very important later on. 
From here, we again see that Keith and Donna are really kind of discussing this situation. They're really kind of talking about what's going on. And Keith says, this doesn't really make any sense. That this really could not have been done by Norman Osborne because Norman Osborne is supposed to be in jail. And so the question is, if Norman Osborne is not in jail, who let him out? And if he is out, then why is it that he's killing Atlanteans instead of going about his normal business, presumably, of attempting to attack Spider-Man? And Keith really kind of talks about how he's been on the force for about 20 years or so, and that he's afraid that this entire situation, everything that's going on here, may turn out to be a lot simpler than the truth. <laughs> 